So a new model for understanding this is perhaps something like this. And I like to use this model where we talk about content as the nouns and curation as the verbs. And not only do we have nouns and verbs in this diagram, we actually have things that are in blue, which is what the crowd does, and things that are in red is what, what institutions, nonprofits, governments, corporate uh, folks do to create content or to curate things. So for example, Wikipedia, the volunteers take websites out there, news articles, uh, existing knowledge on the internet, and they curate it and turn it into knowledge right, by this crowdsourced method. On the flip side, something like CNN iReport takes contributions from the crowd. So the crowd does the reporting, but CNN does the curation. Right? They choose which videos are credible, which videos go on air. And then if we look at something like OpenStreetMap, you not only take government public domain maps, but you actually take contributions from users taking GPS trails in the field, and the crowd turns that into information in what we see on maps. And then a more complex example, the TPM muckraker attorney scandal, where they took a bunch of documents dumped by the government, right? Government do dumped documents. The crowd curated that, picked out documents that are interesting, and TPM muckraker told mainstream media organizations, here are the documents we found interesting, run with it. We don't have enough experience to report on it, and you actually had mainstream news organizations take those documents and go further with it. So it's a much more complex landscape here, but hopefully this shows you the diversity of what's going on out there with crowdsourcing and how content and curation are, are related here. So what's the big idea now? If we have 10 years of experience with Wikipedia, this is what jumped out at me. And you might have seen this you know, jousting between Jay Rosen and the Sunday morning talk show folks when Jay Rosen basically said, my simple fix for the messed up Sunday shows, um, and he was in kind of a public debate with David Gregory who basically said, you know, people can fact check Meet the Press every week on their own terms, we don't have to do it, right? And this really irked a lot of folks, saying, how can you be a responsible journalist and not fact check your folks? And this reminds me of this famous quote, right? Journalists cover words and delude themselves into thinking they have committed journalism, <laughs> right? When David Gregory said that, I said, wow, this is really a, uh, from left field. So what are some of the folks that need to be fact checked? Um, questionable reporting, Sunday morning shows, political debates and speeches. So far, this has been done kind of in a haphazard manner. Um, so what if you took the fact checking organization and the standards that Wikipedia has applied and put it towards news shows. Now you may not know, but this is actually a major engine inside Wikipedia now. If you look at the article on Richard Nixon, there are no fewer than 248 footnotes for his article. And this has changed drastically over the years. You might have looked at Wikipedia in 2003, 2004, and said, this is a joke, this is not a reputable source. But if you look at the number of external links, further reading, and footnotes added to the Richard Nixon article over the years, you look in the last three years, it's as well referenced as anything you'll see out there. If you look even further, this is basically if you print out the entire article as a big strip and hang it on your wall, about one third of the article of Richard Nixon is citations and footnotes. For George W. Bush, about 40% of the article, 356 references in there. So this is a community that knows how to reference, knows how to fact check. Um, so what are some of the efforts that are out there right now? ABC did heed Jay Rosen's uh, idea and said, let's do something with PolitiFact. MeetTheFacts.com is a student effort that tried to do the same type of thing. The problem is that sometimes they do a really good job, but sometimes it's haphazard. It's not really a complete uh, treatment of each of these shows, but they do a pretty good job. MeetTheFacts.com run by two students say sometimes they don't have enough time, eh, they have exams. So um, <laughs> the, some other efforts that are out there, Kevin Drum in 2004 did a really interesting breakdown of a Bush versus Kerry debate where he actually put metrics and charts uh, rating the severity of certain types of th uh, you know, half-truths and their impact on the debate. So really interesting things uh, going on, but the current efforts lack completeness. They have a lag time in terms of days. Uh, there's a variety of ratings methods, and you know, are they adapting as quickly as they should be to being better fact-checking organizations? Um, the ideal effort should have broad, complete coverage, should be quick, should have a common rating system, should have semantic data that you can actually do metrics-based metrics analysis on it. So um, long-term, Fact-checking is part of what I would call an augmented news experience, right? Um, conflict of interest, if you haven't seen polygraph.com, really interesting project uh, done by the Sunlight Foundation, and we need long-term metrics about these things. So just to think about what a wiki fact-check might be, we now have Wikipedia taking mainstream news organizations and putting them, applying them toward knowledge. The problem is that what if the interviews and the raw data or is not good? So that's where a wiki fact-check can actually help promote and uh, create better content for Wikipedia. 
Um, so I invite you to go to wikifactcheck.org. This is a project that just, just got started last month. I uh, had a lot of warm reception from media scholars um, when I talked about it in Poland last month. And uh, this is a wiki. We invite you to go on there, take a look around, contribute your ideas, contribute your folks that uh, we should be talking to uh, with this project. And I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Greg, why don't we uh, have a few minutes for questions with Andy before we move on? <laughs> okay. Sorry, that was really fast. Yes. <laughs> In addition, in addition to the uh, sort of metrics on the original sources, uh, as WikiFactCheck and other fact-checking organizations <coughs> come about, um, should there not be also some rating on the efficacy of each of the fact-checking organizations since political campaigns, for example, have these 24-hour uh, you know, news cycle response teams and you know the facts they pick to check, and the sources they pick to check them can also be a little um, biased, shall we say? Right, I, I agree, and that's one of the reasons why I think having this as a, a central kind of fact check hub would be very interesting, because you have things like newsbusters or accuracy in media, media matters, and it's it's all over the political spectrum. As you said, it's selective, it's haphazard, and it'd be nice to have an effort that, as you said, even incorporates these and rates those folks but also does original fact-checking. Uh, I imagine the Sunday news shows are the easiest ones to start with um, because they've been so focused, uh, people have been focusing on them for a while. Um, yeah. At my university, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, from the liberal arts section of the university, there came this thing that they, they didn't want any students to cite Wikipedia in any term papers. Have you run into that kind of resistance, or do you see that kind of resistance? Is that changing at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with most folks who say that you shouldn't cite Wikipedia in your papers, right? The same way that I wasn't allowed to cite Britannica in my college papers before Wikipedia was around. So I say that hasn't changed, right? Unless you're really doing a story about um, internet phenomenon for which Wikipedia is a very good documenter of those types of things. Um, but there was a good study done by uh, an academic last year for the Wiki SIM conference that said that actually a lot of the news reports about academics hating Wikipedia is actually a little bit overblown. You just need to know how to use it properly. Uh, and, and that's where I think a lot of the, uh, the misconceptions about Wikipedia and academia come from. How do you use it properly? I mean, what, what is the way to use it then? Uh, I use the Marine slogan, no better starting point, no worse ending point for Wikipedia. And I tell that to all journalists too. You know, you, you can't find a better starting point for your research, but make sure it's not your last stop. Make sure that you go to those 356 references and check out the real original source. Is there a question here? Yeah. Yeah. I've been told by folks who work at Walmart that Walmart constantly rewrites the Walmart entry to make sure that it's a very positive rather than a multifaceted reflection of Walmart. And I understand there are many other people who rewrite their own image. How is that for accuracy and how much do you know about that? Oh, it's, it's well known that it happens. Um, and it's, it's, it's bad because as we saw the numbers go down, uh, there are fewer number of people watching the articles, even just maintaining them. Um, you know, Tom Friedman in his book, uh, The World is Flat, said IBM as a full-time PR person just watching the Wikipedia article because they realize anyone under the age of 30 is gonna learn about IBM from Wikipedia and not from IBM.com. And I think almost every Fortune 500 company's got their PR agency really looking at the Wikipedia article. And I think there's, there's a lot of evidence um, from a lot of the activity in Wikipedia that a lot of these companies who probably don't know the better technology are actually going in there and trying to maintain their articles, maintain their articles to be friendly to their company. It's a problem long term, it is. All right, any other um. um I liked your interpretation of why Wiki News didn't work. And I'm really curious as if, if at this point do you think there might be a variation or a way of making Wiki News sort of work? It's a good question. Um, my advice to the Wiki News folks for a long time is stick with original interviews. So the ones that the parts of Wiki News have been very useful are when a Wiki News reporter can get a one-on-one -on -one sit down with the foreign minister of Israel and 
th those have been really good. Or spot news photography has been a really successful part of Wiki News. Um, so real recordable first-hand accounts of stuff. Um, but when it comes to written reports on an event, it's just not the Wiki way. The Wiki way just doesn't work in that sense. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what they can do beyond being um, that original multimedia reporter in the field to provide good original source material. Yeah. Uh, so there's no practical way for a reader to know just how heavily manipulated the content that's appearing on a wiki fact check or Wikipedia is. There's no way to peek behind the curtain and know the degree to which what we're seeing is in fact, um, well, manipulated and whether it's trustworthy. We, we, um, we do there, not there have is. access so, to the So to every article has an edit history that you can look behind. And actually there were some, uh, if you don't log in to Wikipedia, it shows your IP number from where you edited. So one of the researchers went in there and said, for everyone who didn't log in, I can see the IP number. And they traced it back and looked back at all the IP numbers, and they found that companies, government agencies, foreign governments, houses of parliament, Congress, were actually editing articles related to what they were doing. Um, you know, the FBI edited the article, and the, the Pentagon edited the article in there about certain operations and removed them. So well, I, uh, I guess I want to challenge the overall assessment that this is a which is an extremely hopeful one on your part, and, and you know I admire that. But there's no particular reason for us to think that the knowledge system that's growing up under these auspices is any more trustworthy than the heavily manipulated, heavily skewed uh, system that it claims to be superior to and to supplant. Well, you should look at some of the studies done on content. So one of the ones that was done about two months ago that came out was, I think, from the cancer research folks at Thomas, uh, Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And they found that the cancer articles they looked at were all on target. The only complaint they had was it was not as readable as they would like it to be. In, for, in fact, that meant that it was more wonky than they wanted to be, um, which I guess can be kind of a compliment. But at least for the medical researchers who looked at it, they said, all these articles relate to cancer, we found them to be spot on. So most of these studies that you see um, compare favorably at least to Britannica and Carta and those types of uh, publications. And uh, so far, Wikipedia has been slowly increasing quality, but it, can't, it doesn't necessarily guarantee it'll stay there. You know, as we see the numbers decline, we see more and more instances not only of spamming, but of corporate institutional influences on articles that don't really maintain that neutrality that Wikipedia wants. You. I think we better move on. I hope we might be able to come back at the end to questions. Sorry, sure. Charles, you're ready. Go. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll make it very quick. Sure. I, I noticed the, it was an interesting relationship between data and information and so forth, but your model never reached into wisdom. I right. wonder how you see it related to wisdom. I don't, I'm not sure what can actually deliver you to wisdom. <laughs> you're going to have to construct it, right? All right, thank you. I think I'm just about to deliver you to wisdom. Thank you, Andrew, that was terrific. Um, I am delivering you to wisdom now with Adam Clayton Powell III. Um, many of you know Adam. Uh, we are lucky to have him in the Annenberg family, although he's now mostly in DC where he is the university's director of Washington policy initiatives, but he remains a senior fellow at the Center on Communication Leadership and Policy, and uh, we are delighted to have him. I remember, was it four years ago when you presented your uh, research on local news and um, technology, and um, I believe now you have some updates to share with us. Adam. Thank you, Geneva, and thanks uh, to everyone for coming. Um, this originally was going to be a um, an introduction to a new edition of the book, and the more uh, the, the more that I wrote, it, the more it seemed that uh, the introduction was saying, "Ignore what follows," um, <laughs> because it changes uh, so much has changed so quickly. And uh, thank you, Jerry. And as uh, where's Peter? As Peter Herford was saying earlier, he said, "It's changing while we're standing here, or sitting, in your case." Um, so. This is a brief overview of uh, what is in the paper, and at the end, something which is so new it's not even uh, came in after the deadline. Uh, so maybe I should be copying Andrew's wonderful model of having the last chapter online so you can keep updating it. Um, 
keep getting ahead of myself. Um, first thing that seems to have happened in the last four years, much more than before, is you see major news organizations, um, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, going into these micro niches by acquiring or starting blogs um, with some uh, famous uh, flameouts uh, uh, involved. But uh, they're, they're definitely uh, uh, going in there and will probably continue because I don't know how many of you uh, know uh, Patch.com, which I mentioned only in, in passing, but if um, Jean LeBlanc is here, no, she's probably downstairs then. It's the table next to the Annenberg table down in the exhibit area. Um, she told me yesterday that uh, Patch.com now has 99 micro-local news sites, uh, and she's the editor for the ones in Connecticut, uh, and they are hiring. And um, a couple of you mentioned that I shouldn't say that quite so early because the room might empty. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the idea that they might announce their 100th site today, these are micro-local sites. And if you are the New York Times and you see these micro-local sites starting up in Fairfield County, you might say, well, wait a minute. Uh, we, uh, they're, they're taking our game. Uh, we want to uh, get in there, too. Uh, the Washington Post, most famously uh, in politics, has been uh, uh, trying to uh, counter uh, a, a number of others, um, uh, Politico, which of course started online and now actually publishes a newspaper, what an idea. Um, and, uh, and then there are these cross-platform uh, cr cross ideas that are beginning to pop up. The one that's getting the most notice may be the one that News Corp uh, is doing because they own both Sky in the UK and uh, newspapers. And so they're saying, well, gee, maybe we can w uh, work out some kind of promotion where if you subscribe to the Times of London, uh, just for a little bit more, you get Sky, or vice versa. Um, and there are some talks that we know that are going on uh, between local NPR stations. I know there's uh, one person here who has 15 NPR stations, um, and, um, and micro-local sites, that maybe if you are a member of that station, or just a little bit more, you get to be a premium member of the micro-local news site. So there are all kinds of things that are being explored. Someone asked me, what's the uh, business model? I think it was back in the corner, what's the business model uh, that's coming? I think we're seeing lots of business models and some might even succeed. Um, mobile phones, um, they are really becoming a, uh, a major medium uh, more, more quickly outside the United States than in the United States. Uh, Guy Berger was here before, I don't know if he's still here, um, uh, from South Africa. Um, and at a conference that he ran last month, a, a lot of the discussion was of major news organizations uh, reaching out to mobile phone listeners and viewers. In Kenya, there are a lot of people who watch what we would call television over their mobile phone um, with uh, news services. WTOP in Washington uh, a couple of weeks ago started IDing themselves as WTOP on air, online, and mobile. Some very interesting. NPR's podcasts. Uh, someone at NPR told me this week that uh, every now and then the podcast of an NPR newscast gets larger audience than the radio audience. Fascinating. Um, this opens up a whole range of geo-related content uh, 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 issues, uh, content and revenue, uh, because uh, there's always been the, the dream on the part of advertisers, and I guess uh, Jerry Swirling is much more the expert on that, that uh, as you're walking uh, past the Sheraton Hotel, that on your mobile phone it would say, gee, don't you want to stop in at the Starbucks and get a cup of coffee? Well, that kind of thing is actually uh, becoming more and more, uh, uh, more, and more commonplace. Um, applications. Uh, a lot of publishers have looked to the iPad as uh, their salvation. We'll see. Um, it, um, it certainly uh, could offer up some interesting news applications which we're just starting to see. Uh, the iPhone is now being used by radio reporters as a production device. You can collect your, you collect your sound, edit your sound, write your piece, do a rap, and feed it all from your iPhone. So when you have something that small uh, for radio, um, someone in the room invariably says, well, that's very nice, but when is it going to happen for television? Well, in my bag is something I was hoping to demonstrate, but there's not enough internet signal in here to do it, where uh, from a uh, plain vanilla laptop or iPad or, or sub-notebook, um, you can do a high-definition uh, television report, just as radio reporters are doing it uh, from iPhones. And oh, by the way, you can also video conference in HD with 40 users, with no hardware, no additional hardware, just a download. Um, social networks, a lot has been written about this, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, so what's on. Um, they become a, uh, a medium in themselves. Uh, after the Chilean earthquake, I was teaching a course last spring, and one of the students was from Chile, 
and she said that uh, the, her major source of information was uh, uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, the following week, I asked how much of what she had read was true, um, and she said, oh, some of it. Um, so uh, there is that crowdsource validation problem that uh, uh, Andrew was touching on. Well, there is some interesting software being developed in that area. Um, Ushahidi, which is a, a, an East African software company, has developed software called Swift River. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you have looked at it. It's, it's fascinating. There are a couple in the back, on the front. Fascinating. It, it looks very intimidating. Play with it. it. It's not as intimidating as it seems. Uh, basically, you can put in uh, crowdsourced information, and it, uh, is, it's, a, it's a very subtle and powerful and sophisticated tool. Uh, it generates a numerical uh, probability that that information is correct by comparing it with all kinds of other information. So if there's one source, to cite one of Andrew's uh, examples, if there's one source, you really don't know because there's only one source of information. But as you get more and more sources from, uh, uh, from different people, and they may be sending you information on their mobile phones, whatever, uh, that you, be, you can begin to uh, establish a, uh, a record of some credibility. Can Ushahidi's system be hacked? Um, probably. It's sort of spy versus spy. You keep, uh, uh, you keep uh, moving up. Ushahidi has some other things on it. Uh, and again, um, I'd heard of them uh, I guess some time ago, but met one of the people from uh, the software company at this conference that Guy ran in uh, South Africa. And uh, she told me that one of their uh, uh, clients is uh, the Washington Post Company. That's interesting. The Washington Post Company is using for its newspaper software from an East African software company. Uh, she said they used it during the Washington snowstorm as a mapping device. Um, finally, something which is not in the printed report, um, the role of Google. We all know about Google as revenue enhancement, or maybe we uh, don't know all that Google can do uh, for us or to us. Um, but interesting, interestingly, Google is emerging as what I call a content threat, or at least a content mo modifier, in some interesting ways. Uh, last Sunday's Washington Post had in the Ombudsman column uh, a very interesting, um, uh, sort of in passing, a very interesting revelation. Uh, and the column was about the decline of the Washington Post Sunday edition uh, circulation ink on paper circulation, which has been significant. And so they're taking some steps to uh, uh, aggressively uh, introduce new content and a new editor. Um, in passing, what they revealed was that the Washington Post had decided to move a lot of its original content from the Sunday newspaper to the Monday newspaper. Why would they do that? <clears throat> because the online audience was better on Monday. And so they weakened the Sunday newspaper, which now they're scrambling to make up. So they were getting some extra hits on Monday, but at the price of losing uh, circulation on Sunday. So now uh, uh, the second area, and I know uh, some of your universities might even teach this, is how you write, if you are a reporter or a news writer, uh, how you write so that your story is picked up more widely by Google. Uh, and there's some simple things you, ne you never use in the headline. You never use anything ending in ING. Google doesn't like that. Um, you do not use links anymore in your story. Google doesn't like that. And so what had been useful to uh, readers, listeners, and viewers, uh, links and stories, for example, well, no, we're not going to do that anymore because we want to get more, uh, 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 more attention on Google, um, which raises the attention of who we're writing for. But um, as uh, Peter says, uh, when did you get into the business? Um, so those are some of the things. There are, uh, there are a few others. As I said, I'm going to demonstrate something which I think is has been the, the holy grail for some time of uh, at least the past three or four years of companies large, such as Microsoft, and small, such as startups, which is the ability, again, just with a software download to the plain vanilla PC and the plain vanilla internet to do a bank level security HD uh, video conference or video feed uh, over the internet. And if the Emirates think they have troubles with, uh, uh, with BlackBerry, uh, just wait. As the founder of BlackBerry said this week, it's the internet, get over it. So um, on that, um, I think that we've moved, as some of you have heard me say this, from uh, Nick Negroponte's formulation uh, at the MIT Media Lab uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, of uh, the daily me, uh, became the internet's instant me, and now with social networks we have the instant us, and that's going to require a whole new set of you know, wiki fact check, um, a swift river, other kinds of crowdsourcing, 
so that we know uh, uh, what it is we can trust. And uh, there's my email address, which is the one thing that, uh, well, my name. My name and my email address in USC don't change. Other than that, my cards are now useless, but I'll give you one if you want. So, thank you. Uh, and now uh, I have uh, nine minutes for Q&A before Geneva puts me in the penalty box, which is around the corner, and you hear, ah! So, uh, yes, uh, Tom. Adam, many of us have relied on consumer reports and other guides to rank over in a quote neutral way uh, competing claims at excellence and so forth. There must be a place now for rank ordering the validity and accuracy of innumerable sources, many of which are dubious, many of which are too new to be tested. Who's doing that uh, and what are their criteria? Um, well, that's really interesting. I think that uh, the organizations represented by people in this room uh, uh, are doing some of that, but it's in your question, you point out that uh, some of them are too new, uh, some of them are experimental, some of them uh, uh, may be um, uh, niches. I mean, the, 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 the patch.com site serving, I don't know if there is one, but uh, serving uh, South Arlington, Virginia. Uh, how much information do we have about uh, who's, um, uh, who's doing that? Um, I think that here it's going to be um, uh, the, the wisdom of crowds. I think we're going to have to see uh, what, uh, what transpires. Uh, and sometimes it'll be a surprise. Uh, last night, um, a few of us were talking uh, with Joe Saltzman, who's across the hall doing an, another paper. Um, and our colleague said that uh, he used to write for the LA Times Syndicate, not realizing that the LA Times Syndicate, uh, as a freelancer, the LA Times Syndicate, not realizing that the LA Times Syndicate sold to everybody. And so his byline would appear everywhere. And he said he was in the, in, in the checkout line of the supermarket. And there was his byline in the National Enquirer. <laughs> oh my goodness, what's my byline doing in the National Enquirer? They stole my story and they used it. The, no, they bought the story and used his byline. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and he said that of all of the LA Times Syndicate's subscribers uh, who would pick up his stories, that the only call he ever received for fact checking was from the National Enquirer. Uh, so, uh, so sometimes it's not who you expect. <laughs> if daily newspapers go to the tablets and find a way to charge for their product and get people to subscribe, what happens to their websites? Will they kill their websites? Will they reconfigure what information they put on those websites? I think we're going to see every possible uh, variation of that. Uh, what people want, uh, what publishers want, is the, the Wall Street Journal uh, model where you get a lot of money from, from uh, your content online. Um, as you know, the New York Times tried it with their, uh, their columnists, and the columnists hated it. Um, you're going to see every possible um, variation as people, uh, uh, and, and, and Murdoch has been quite open about this. News Corp, he hopes, is going to lead the way. Uh, I have not seen, um, I don't, I don't uh, check News of the World very often, or The Sun, but I do see The Times every now and then, and you, you can see they're, they're trying to play with that to see how they're going to uh, uh, get more revenue. I think you're going to start to also see that in, um, from broadcasters, uh, whether you're talking about everything like CBS's deal uh, with uh, Comcast, um, where, uh, they, where the ABC over the air television network starts to get revenue just as uh, Disney's ESPN cable uh, network gets revenues. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so you're, you're going to have something which will actually look very much like a very old newspaper model where you have uh, subscribers paying and advertisers paying, sort of uh, the classic uh, two revenue streams. And of course, we have a third revenue stream now for the New York Times, which is uh, Carlos Slim, which has other implications. <laughs> well, uh, whoops, one more. A lot's been written about the long tail and the possibilities that exist in the long tail. What's happening in the center? That is, is I guess the question is, is there still room for a general news organization in the future? Th that, you put your finger on exactly what is um, uh, not only happening in uh, journalism, but in, uh, the, in, in books, uh, which I guess Chris Anderson was also writing about, in magazines, in movies. Uh, you have the blockbusters, and you have the small art things, and in the center is dropping out because it's not economically viable, uh, at least as, as uh, as currently structured. 
Um, and, and yes, that's how the, the, the um, uh, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, um, New York Times, whatever, about Carlos Slim, uh, they're, they're gonna carry on.